So, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Roger Casali from New Europeans. I'm standing in for my uh, colleague, for our colleague, uh, Andy Slaughter MP, who is the Honorary Secretary of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Citizens' Rights. We look at the situation of EU citizens and EEA citizens in the UK, and uh, reciprocally, the position of um, British citizens living in the EU and the EEA. And our last meeting was dedicated to the challenges that lie ahead for EU citizens, EEA citizens in the UK with uh, Charlton Bryan as the speaker. And you can find a podcast of that meeting on the neweuropeans.uk website. I'm delighted that uh, today's meeting uh, we have as a speaker speaking today in a private capacity, uh, Professor Michaela Benson, who's also a member of New Europeans, who's going to uh, tell us about the situation and the challenges still faced by British citizens in the EU EEA. And Michaela will speak for a few minutes, and then we will also hear from Debbie Williams and Clarissa Kilwick, who are two campaigners uh, and themselves uh, uh, Brits living in the EU. Uh, to hear directly the voice uh, from British citizens living in the EU in terms of the challenges still faced um, six years on from the referendum by Britons in Europe. So uh, we will then have time for some questions and discussions and debate. So thank you, Michaela, for being with us and to Debbie and Clarissa too. And to those of you who are on the Zoom call and to those of you who will be watching later when we distribute the podcast, Without further ado, over to you, Michaela. Thank you very much, Roger. So um, I'm going to jump straight in. So I'm going to be talking about the challenges relating to citizens' rights that face British citizens living in the EU and EEA. And I want to start here by echoing something that my colleague Charlotte O'Brien um, said in her presentation to the APPG when she was talking about the challenges facing EU citizens in the UK. She stressed that there were considerable risks ahead. And I'd like to highlight that this is also true of British citizens living in the EU uh, and EEA, but this is multiplied by 27 member states and, and of course the EEA states as well. In the face of those who are saying that Brexit is done, I want to stress that this is only the beginning of things for British citizens who were living in the EU before Brexit. So why does it matter that we're looking at 27 different countries? Well, it matters because each of these countries is responsible for implementing citizens' rights provisions in relation to their resident Brits. And so they have been coming up with domestic solutions to the problem of Brexit. And more than that, this has often been devolved to a local level. So we have municipal offices in local regions and areas trying to um, accommodate the implementation of citizens' rights, which is fundamentally different from the way that it's been managed in the UK, I would stress, where it's been centralised through the EUSS. So what this means really in terms of thinking about the challenges is that in the case of British citizens living in the EU, it's going to be even more of a challenge to keep an eye on the challenges that people are facing going forwards. Now, before I move on to five headlines about the future challenges, I want to stress that the population of British citizens living in the EU is for the most part of working age and below. It's something in the region of 80% of that population. And it's as diverse as the British population living in the UK. It includes children in care, vulnerable and chronically ill adults, as well as young people in precarious employment. And I state this here because there is a common misconception that all Brits in the EU are retired and elderly. And this leads to a consideration of a very narrow, if nonetheless incredibly important, set of issues, which are not representative of the broader issues that are faced by that broad population. So in accounting for the challenges, my presentation is going to have to be very broad brush, because as I said, 27 states, a very diverse population. The five headlines that I'm going to focus on today are the implementation gap, the future shift from temporary to permanent resident status, the impact of um, a future lack of monitoring, democratic representation, support and advocacy for British citizens in the EU, 
The issues concerning that British citizens who might at some, sorry, the issues concerning some British citizens who might at a future date want to return to the UK and onward movement rights within the EU. So the first of these, the implementation gap. For the last few years, I and others have been warning that despite the agreements reached and the rollout of implementation, there were always going to be people who fall between the gaps. This is something that will disproportionately impact on the vulnerable within the population. But also, as we've started to hear, and we may hear shortly from Debbie and Clarissa, it also impacts on those who are extremely well integrated socially and economically in the places they live. And I include among those British children who have been raised almost exclusively in EU countries, who have kind of lived their lives alongside EU citizen national children, um, and are not, are not really aware, don't, don't really live in that universe where they might have been considering Brexit as, as an issue um, relating to their future employment and, and various other things. Now, I signal these two sides of the story of the people who might fall between the gaps, who may as yet have failed to get their residence permits, because I think that this signals some of the problems with the ways in which the local implementation, implementation was communicated and the networks within which people were working to move that, that information out. We can see, for example, when we look at the statistics about the numbers of application for new residence status, so that's the withdrawal agreement residence permits among British citizens in the EU, included in the latest, and I would stress final report from the Specialised Joint Committee on Citizens' Rights, that we can already see there's, there's, there's a bit of a shortfall in terms of the estimates of British citizens living in most member states and the uptake uh, of these applications. And it's particularly alarming when we look at those countries who chose to operate what's called a declaratory system, where people who had existing residence permits as EU citizens um, were required to swap those in for new statuses. To be honest, at the moment, when we're talking about an implementation gap, we don't really know how many people this might include. And it could take years and even decades to see the fallout from a change in status like this as we saw in the case of the Windrush generation in the UK. But I think it's important that we anticipate what the potential consequences of this might be for those who are unregistered in consequence of Brexit and undocumented in their place of residence. Now, as I said, this is broad brush and the consequences are going to vary from country to country, depending on what access to what uh, is, um, sorry, depending on what the residence permit gain, gives access to or not. So a very, very simple example is that in some countries, in order to access healthcare, you may need a residence permit, while in others, you might not. So you can see that in a country where you need a, a residence permit in order to access healthcare, um, that it might come to light pretty quickly that you are unregistered. Whereas in a situation where you're not required to produce such documentation, it's gonna take a lot longer and there could be uh, potential impacts down the line. So I'm gonna move over to this, um, this future shift from temporary to permanent status. We can also see from the statistics that there are a significant number of people who in the next five years are going to need to reapply for permanent residence. And in France, which is the second largest population of British citizens in the EU, it looks like this is going to be more than 50,000 people who are going to need to go through that process. I'd stress that this transition in terms of status is another flashpoint where people could fall between the gaps and individualized deadlines leave it up to the individual to secure their future status. So we can. So the question in my mind is what will happen if people let these lapse? Are we going to end up with a greater number of people who are undocumented? Um, and yet we also don't know what the process for this is going to be in each of the member states yet. That hasn't been communicated or what happens if people undergo changes in their lives in the meantime, from their employment status, to marriage, to having children? And that links to my next point. One of the successes, uh, well, I don't, I don't know whether success is the right word, but what we saw over the last few years um, was, you know, monitoring of what was happening, a little bit of democratic representation, some support and advocacy, uh, for British citizens living in the EU. But going forwards, the future looks a bit bleak. There is no independent monitoring authority for British citizens who live in the EU. What we're faced with is decreasing scrutiny of the implementation of their rights. 
there are not going to be any more joint specialised committees and implementation is going to be reported only annually. If we pair this with the limited de um, democratic representation of British citizens in the EU, where they don't have democratic representation in their states of residence or at EU, rep or at EU level, and in a lot of cases, no longer in the UK because they lost their rights to vote because they've been out of the country for too long, then we can start to see that this is looking pretty bleak. The support funds that the British government rolled out have now closed. And this week saw the closure of British in Europe, the largest umbrella organization of British citizens living in the EU, who really spearheaded the advocacy for British citizens living in the EU. So without all of this, who should British citizens in the EU turn to? And I think that's a really, really urgent question that we need to address. Now, my final two points, I'm just going to run over very, very quickly. Some of the issues that British citizens returning to the UK are facing include whether in the future, after the seven year grace period, British children will be eligible for home fees at universities. Now, there has been a grace period agreed, but we also know that a lot of universities are not even aware of this provision and so have been charging British children from the EU international fees. The issue of returning to the UK with non-UK spouses is something that's concerning lots of people or non-UK family members. From the end of March, British citizens returning to the UK with such relations will have to go through immigration controls, just like anybody else bringing in dependent family members. I'd also like to flag a possibility that we might need to look at what challenges returning British citizens face in accessing welfare, uh, benefits, etc. And I'm sure that this is something that Pilar, who I can see is here, might have more information on um, from her research with people repatriating at this point in time. And my final point uh, around the movement rights within the EU. I don't know whether people are very well aware, but the rights under the withdrawal agreement only um, uh, do not permit onward movement within the EU. They relate to people in their country of residence at that point in time. And as Debbie, I think, is going to discuss, that's created some problems for people who work across borders, among other things. Anyway, I'm going to hand over to Clarissa and Debbie, who are going to share a little bit with you about the human face of this. Thank you very much indeed, Michaela. Um, Debbie, are you going to go first? We'll jump straight in to you, please, and then to Clarissa. And uh, perhaps five to seven minutes in total, if that's OK. Uh, Debbie. Oh, <laughs> Let, I'll try. Hi, thank you, Michaela. And hopefully um, what I'm going to read will uh, complement what you've just said, um, uh, because there's no way we can cover everything today anyway in any detail. So first of all, I'm going to start with who are the British living overseas and why do they matter? Well, migration matters. We all know that for many complex reasons, which we don't have time to go into today. But for me, it's about diversity, humanity and equality. Sharing things like culture, language and customs is only a good thing. And we, the British living in Europe, are no different. So as a group of emigrants and immigrants, we epitomise modern mobility. The right to free movement of persons, which is often portrayed as a dirty word, in the UK was two-way. An opportunity for people from all walks of life to find work, retire or study. I and mean, it was not just for the wealthy. Um, Michaela touched on this, uh, statistics, UN statistics, um, which need updating, say that there are 1.2 million British citizens living in the EU, EU EFTA, and nearly 80% of us are working age or younger, and that, of course, includes children and students. So not quite what's portrayed in the media. <clears throat> Research in our group has demonstrated that most of our members, and I think this is, uh, this is a general thing, moved for work reasons, moved to the EU for work reasons, and the second reason was for love, uh, family reasons. So it must be noted as well that not all of us have moved away permanently. Our rights as British Europeans living and working on the continent were undermined for a lesser status. Um, that's absolutely true. There is a need to look to the future to restore this balance and to make reparations. I'll come on to that a little bit uh, later. To cover some, certainly not all of the ongoing areas of concern, I'm going to um, read out a couple of testimonies and I'll give you the headings to put them into context. So here are the voices of real people. So we're talking about voting. 
So MS in Spain said, I was disenfranchised by the UK many years ago. I have been further disenfranchised by Brexit, having now lost my vote in European elections. Consequently, I have no representation at a national or international level anywhere. A little bit about cross-border services now, um, or cross-border working. The provision of cross-border services between the UK, EU and EFTA, including the rendering of services by British citizens resident in one EU EFTA member state to clients in another, needs immediate clarity. This is causing life-changing problems for British workers, the self-employed uh, SME owners in Europe. I'm going to read a testimony from Chris, um, who lives in the Netherlands. Who can blame them? Business doesn't like uncertainty. The idea of waiting until the final outcome of the Brexit negotiations just doesn't work. This is something that is happening right now. Our rights to continue with business across borders as normal have been extinguished, especially in small countries like the Netherlands and Luxembourg. How can you be a valuable employee or run a business with these restrictions suddenly enforced on you, especially when your competitors can continue with free movement? As we are now landlocked, our Dutch, Belgian, French, Spanish colleagues at work can continue as before. Being singled out in this way, where you have worked and lived for years already, is absolutely disgraceful. And I've got a question here, um, Anon in Germany. I mean, I suppose you're going to answer it today. So what sanctions are there if you live in the Schengen zone as a Brit and you break the rules? by working as a self-employed painter and decorator or a carpenter across the border. For example, Landgraf is a Dutch German town, Dutch town and a German town with an invisible border. And the guy goes on to say, I think, but it's unclear that you can be fined and banned for Schengen, from Schengen for up to five years. What happens to your residency rights and your home if this is the case? Who's gonna answer these questions? So moving on to the right to return, Surinder Singh, as Michaela uh, mentioned, for UK uh, citizens with non-UK family members ends on 11pm uh, GMT on the 29th of March, the grace period. Um, so here is a testimony from a former UK veteran. I joined the Royal Marines in February in 1986 and did active service. I was medically discharged from the service due to injuries and illness. I have a Polish wife and daughter and we live in Poland. Some of my family live in the UK and my mother has, is ill, she has an illness. And should I need to return to live in the UK after March, 2022 to be near her, I will not be able to take my wife and daughter with me. Uh, other real consequences um, of what's been happening and this is going on into the future. So this is an anonymous person living in the, an EU country who's claiming benefits welfare. I have spent more of my adult life in this EU country than in Britain. Beside the fact I have no money, property or close family still alive and resident in the UK. So I am truly in limbo. I may be left with nowhere to call home and nowhere to go. At this point in time, I am living on state benefits. It was not my intention to do so, and I hope that it will not continue. As an EU citizen of long-standing residence, I was entitled to benefits. However, as I am no longer a new citizen, it's not outside the realms of possibility that I may be asked to leave the country that has become my home. How on earth did I come to be in such a position? It is a very long and complex story, and I am most definitely waiting to see if the execution, Executioner's Acts will completely fall on my life. So I think this gives you the flavour, this strength of feeling that's still there, these unanswered questions. And I, I am coming to the end. So Michaela touched on looked after children, uh, British children living in the European Union, which is a subject both and I, her and I are very passionate about. Um, children in care and care leavers specifically face significant barriers in any registration system. I think we all know that. There are also questions of competence, who acts for the minors to secure their status, and are there social workers and guardians aware of the requirement to do this? These questions were raised by Michael and myself in the joint report that we, um, that we wrote uh, last year and needs close monitoring for the future. One family in France told us differences in the legal procedures for looked after children in France and other countries cause problems. 
When I have tried to find assistance in France, I've been told by social services that I have no standing because the care order is not for a French court. It's so complex. So during the last few years of the investigation into this matter, um, there's been nothing concrete published on the subject. Another issue where there must be compliancy research and workable statistics. It's a must. And the same applies to any minority or vulnerable group, of course. We must speak for them. They should not be invisible nor fall through the cracks. Uh, we must ensure that we as a demographic, we, we are a mirror of society, have a legitimate voice, that we have concrete representation. We must become visible again and we should be valued for our contributions. After all, British citizens overseas, whether they realise it or not, are involved in international relations, foreign policy, and are influential in promoting trade, cooperation, language, education, culture, and all sorts of other areas. So let us now today, right now, consult, begin to find practical solutions, e.g. Vote for Life, solid representation, e.g. dedicated MPs for the community, and make the British living in Europe valued, consulted, included, equal, and visible. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Debbie. And let me go straight to Clarissa Kilwick. Clarissa, two minutes, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, um, backing up what uh, Michaela was saying, I really do think that the big challenges come from the fact that we're spread out across so many countries. And as Debbie was touching on, what we've got is little minority groups within minority groups within a minority group and these things are defined by people's personal circumstances and the, the rules are going to vary from country to country and as um, M Michaela uh, touched on uh, in Italy for example we've got 8,000 town halls 100 immigration offices who are all uh, processing things in their own way um, uh, I'll just give you a few uh, real examples of people and uh, problems that they're having at the moment. Um, uh, driving licenses. Uh, we have a woman in Italy who is deaf. She failed to meet the deadline to exchange her driving license. She now fears that because of her language problems, she will not be able to pass an Italian driving test. There is no agreement, a bilateral agreement yet, uh, Italy, Spain, and Malta. And I'm very glad um, Paolo is here because uh, this is an issue that doesn't only affect British people here. Uh, Italians too, who took their driving tests in the UK are faced with this problem uh, that they may have to take um, a, a new driving test. Uh, you know, some of these issues are not directly in the withdrawal agreement. And, and just to demonstrate the, the inconsistencies so uh, a child in Italy who is over the age of six will get their own residency card, whereas in France, you have to be 18. So does this matter? Well, uh, an example, a, a boy in France, he can't get holiday work like his friends because he needs some kind of permit to be able to do it. Um, so we have no uh, consistency across the board. Um, and the thing about the right to uh, return, uh, a woman in France, for example, her husband is undergoing cancer treatment. So they are not able to make this March deadline in order to get back to the UK. They want to go back and live with their daughter. And I think it just shows that you know people's lives are complicated. They can't plan around arbitrary uh, deadlines. And actually, uh, the, so the immigration rules, it goes further than that for people who maybe only even want to go to visit uh, the UK on holiday, visit to uh, family, if their um, family members are non-EU. So a man with a Ukrainian wife said in future, he's probably resigned to going to the UK by himself because it will be too difficult for her uh, to get a, a visa. Um, now, uh, just as a demonstration of how people are affected very differently, and as Michaela, I think, touched on the thing about children who grew up here 
and were not the ones who made the decision to move. In my own situation as an English teacher, come the end of transition, nothing really much changed. I continued working. Perhaps now, I, now I'm asked to do workshops on Brexit. Before, I was asked to help students who want to study or work in the UK. But for my son, the change has been dramatic. At the end of transition, after that, he had to physically leave the country where he was at university. He was in the Netherlands. He had to leave. Otherwise, he would have lost his citizenship request uh, in Italy. So now he's in a lot of difficulty how to finish his studies. At the moment, he would not be able to compete very well in the job market. Um, we do not yet have properly available to us the EU long-term permit, which would give him some mobility rights because there's nothing in place. So the result is uh, he's a child who grew up here, spent all his life here, but now has uh, fewer rights than all of the other kids that he grew up with. Um, and we, like many others, have resorted to paying lawyers to help us. Um, but a study that I did uh, in Brexpats found that uh, the highest cost of all for people has in fact um, been stress. And you know, the last five and a half years, almost six years, uh, really have been quite horrible. And for a young person like my son, you know, that's that's a, a quarter of his life. Um, uh, and I, as I'm in Italy, I just want to finish very quickly with uh, a quote from uh, President Mattarella, who was re-elected recently. He said in his speech, he said, greetings to fellow citizens around the globe who are sharing Italian culture and Italian language all around the world. And it was just so inclusive. And I just can't help feeling that if the UK valued its citizens abroad, then we might have fared a bit better. Anyway, that's, that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Clarissa. Questions, uh, reactions we have about 10 or 15 minutes or so we can dedicate to this. And I'd like to give our uh, speakers, thank you to them, the opportunity to um, very briefly come back at the end, particularly uh, obviously uh, Michaela on any of the general points that are, that are raised in response to her presentation, but also on the commentaries uh, that we've heard from Debbie and, and Clarissa. So questions, responses, um, perhaps put a note in the chat if you'd like to ask a question. I, I'm going to ask Paolo Murray from the Italian uh, Embassy, diplomat from the Italian Embassy who's with us, delighted that you're with us, Paolo. What did you make of that? What can you tell us about the situation for Britons in Italy from your, your perspective and um, your feelings about this? Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Uh, thank you, everyone who intervened. It was very interesting to uh, understand the opinions uh, on, on what is going on on the other side um, from where I am, because now I'm based in, in London at the embassy here. Um, obviously, uh, it is, uh, um, it, it is uh, important to collect, to gather this information because we need to address all those cases that we have been uh, receiving on, on both ways, on both sides. Uh, here, we deal with those uh, 500,000 Italians who have applied for the EU settlement scheme here in the UK. And, and we need to make sure that everything goes uh, smoothly and seamlessly in Italy as well for the UK citizens who are in Italy. From what I know, the Italian system in this case is one of the easiest ones. Uh, they really managed to make it as uh, as lean as possible, so requiring the least um, um, conditions and and, uh, and 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 things to do in order to be uh, regularly residing in Italy. Uh, obviously, as it was mentioned, it's a cross-cutting issue over 27 countries, so we cannot have one size fits all uh, approach uh, to this case, but we're doing uh, our best. I know from uh, what we see in Brussels that the uh, 
complaints, as I can, may call them this way, uh, towards what happens in Italy are really to the minimum, which means that by definition, everything is working well. Obviously, there's always room for improvement. And you mentioned uh, driving licenses, you mentioned some situations for students and, and so on. Those, I can assure you that our authorities are working on, on, on that. I represent my country here. Clearly, the UK embassy in Rome is doing its part and we're cooperating with them. Since you mentioned the large number of Britons abroad at this point, we as a, as, a, as a country are an example of that because we have millions of Italians registered abroad who vote from abroad as a constituency of Italians abroad. Uh, so they are still a large part of our community and they're involved in daily matters politically and socially and culturally. Clearly the UK citizens in Italy as any other foreigner in Italy are uh, a huge contribution. Uh, provide a huge contribution to, to the development of our country, culturally, socially, economically, uh, every day. So uh, it, it is in our interest to make sure that they have the best um, scenario and the best conditions to, be continu to continue to live in our country at the most, uh, with the most uh, opportunities they have received so far. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. If I may say, I think those remarks will be uh, very, very welcome and welcomed by the MPs who watch this uh, podcast afterwards. Thank you very much for being with us. Let me go to Lord Clan Arti. Uh, Lord Clan Arti, you're muted. Who I think has put in a question in the chat. Um, We were having difficulty hearing you, so I think we... Um... Right, I've unmuted. That's it. So I was, I was in the chat, which is taking hold of my screen, so sorry about that. Um, but there's a couple of things, really. I, I, well, last about a year ago, just over a year ago, um, we were working with Baroness Hamwe and myself and others were working with Debbie and others on this whole thing about the, the, the deadline, which now is looming. And I'm just wondering, really, what, you know, it's a very basic question, what we can do in, in Parliament about this specific issue. Um, and I know, you know, there's been dialogue with the Commons and, and with um, uh, colleagues in the Lords, but I'm just wondering precisely where, where we are at with that at the moment in terms of being able to, to do anything about it. I just wonder if we can still fight this March 29th deadline. I mean, now would be a good time seeing it's coming up so quickly. Great. I think that would be a good moment to hear back from our, our panel. Um, who would like to go first in response to that question in particular? Um, I, I, I'd like to, if that's okay. Yeah, maybe. Go ahead. Yeah. I don't know how effective it would be, Nick, because if you remember that debate that we were, we listened to the, the government definitely um, said they were trying to, uh, what was the word, level up, the famous levelling up for all the rights of all the British abroad to make it the same. Well, actually, for us, it's a different situation. Um, I would really like to um, go for it then. I mean, it's worth, it's, worth, it's worth a punt, as they say. Yes. It, it, I mean, it, it, if, if you do nothing else, it raises the, you know, anything that's mentioned in, in you know, in Parliament means that it, it, it gets onto the agenda, it, the issue is raised, and you never quite know where it's going to go. So it's okay. just, a, you know, it, it's a very, the thing is, I, I, there's been a lot, there's been, a, a, you know, a, um, really interesting listening to all the speakers today, and, you know, thanks so much for that. But this a specific issue, is a very particular issue, which I wondered if it's something that we could we can pull at, basically. Um, let me go, because time is short, to uh, Pila, Pila Serrano, who is a researcher and doing research at the moment, or an academic and doing research at the moment, on citizens returning to their um, countries of origin. Pila, can you say something just very briefly to us about your work and this aspect of it? Thank you, thank you, uh, Roger. Um, um, uh, I am uh, at the moment preliminary results, but um, I would like to highlight um, the very important point. Um, first, uh, uh, from my investigation, um, 
Uh, I would like to to highlight the the British government don't have a, any um, a structure uh, a special plans to to return, and this is important because it's uh, because it's invisible. It's uh, um, as uh, the British government uh, uh, think. Uh, that the returning is no problem and is problem is is a big problem because uh, if uh, uh, British people uh, don't have a uh, financial or family resources, it's very difficult the the returning process. And uh, on the other hand, um, um, it's very important the the problem with uh, information because many many people don't have. Uh, uh, clear in, uh, information, clear advice, uh, how they uh, can manage the, the returning process. And the problem is uh, they are in a unstable, uh, uh, unpredictable situation, uh, both uh, in Spain or in other countries in the European um, Union. Um, in, in the UK, both uh, also, uh, because uh, they are a period uh, without rights in Spain and in the UK and in other countries. And in, especially in vulnerable population, uh, the, the old people, for example, uh, they don't have a a guarantee in the health and social benefits and services. Uh, and, and the problem is the uncertainty of the people, because people don't, uh, uh, don't know uh, how are the rules, uh, how uh, they can manage the situation. Um, I think um, this is a, a very important challenge in this moment because uh, people are uh, lost uh, uh, at the moment uh, with the procedure, the administrative procedure um, and the rules. Um, they um, need more. Um, probably uh, the government and the embassy support, but um, of course the the third sector and charities organization um, have uh, doing a very very good job but it's not enough it's not enough because um i think uh, the the support from the the lawyer for for example is very very important in this moment but i am uh, doing doing uh, my research in this moment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that contribution. So we're coming to a close. <clears throat> I don't think it was in the front of policymakers' mind, minds when uh, uh, Brexit happened and the events afterwards, what would be the situation of British citizens returning to the UK or indeed the other way around. But as we've just heard, that is also... Uh, uh, important dimension of this and one that will grow in importance and one of the aspects of it I think that it also raises is the lack of representation. We heard from Paolo about how the Italians abroad can elect MPs in the Italian Parliament. So I'm going to just read a final question from uh, Ruby Siegler about representation of British citizens uh, abroad and then perhaps ask Michaela uh, just to give a final word, and then I think we'll have to say thank you and wrap up for today. But we do hope that you'll all come back on a future um, occasion very soon, in fact. So Rufus' question is, uh, perhaps to put it to you, Michaela, and perhaps you could answer this and then also just uh, give a final word. Do you think the prospective UK legislative changes that are set to remove the 15-year bar to voting, so you see campaigning is, uh, is, 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 can be effective. That's something we've been campaigning on New Europeans for a long time and Harry Schindler has spearheaded, uh, Harry Schindler, who's of course based in, in Italy, um, that, that is coming about that change. Um, should it lead as a next step? So we might think what's the next step could be for British citizens abroad, given that success, 
Should it as a next step, Rufi asks, uh, lead to the creation of separate parliamentary seats for Britons abroad? And in this vein, a seat for Britons in Europe, giving the specific challenges, many of which we've heard about today, of course, and the need for advocacy. Michaela, um, as Rufi points out, this is common practice, and as we've heard uh, from amongst other European states, and as we've heard, that is true of Italy. Michaela, what's your view about that, um, a very quick response to what, uh, and summary of what's, well, well, not a summary, but response to what being heard today and the response to Ruby's question, please, back to you, but just a minute or two, if, if possible. Okay, so um, I think that the, the short and sweet answer, which I'm sure that many British citizens living in the EU who found themselves unable to vote in the referendum would say is yes, please. OK, um, I think that this needs to be paired with making sure. And of course, I mean, these two things would, would be tied together anyway. Um, if, if there was electoral representation for British citizens living abroad more generally or in the EU, um, actually, that would fundamentally change things because their concerns would find their way onto the parliamentary papers. Let's be honest about that. That's how it works in other countries. Um, I think um, that. We do also need to bear in mind that, yes, we've got cases where that does happen, but there are also cases where it doesn't happen at all. Um, and we also need to be aware of the limitations of the elections bill around the enfranchisement of British citizens living, in the, um, living abroad, which will only extend that right to people who are still on the electoral register. That's my understanding. So, so it will be limited franchise for a limited number of people. Um, nevertheless, better than nothing. Um, in respect to some of the other points that were raised, is this the time to raise the question of the March 29th deadline, which is to do with the return of British citizens with their non-UK spouses? Um, it could be quite a good time to do that because of course immigration is on everybody's mind at the moment because the Nationality and Borders Bill is currently going through Parliament. Um, and so, you know, it's obviously it would be controversial to extend that right to British citizens who live in the EU in the context of that border bill but it could be a good time to do it. And I just wanted to come back to something Paolo said about Italy and the implementation. I have a suspicion that one of the reasons that nothing is really coming to light that much in Italy is because actually the number of British citizens who've registered falls really far short of the number of estimated British citizens who are there. So at the moment, the estimates are at 33,800 and the total number of applications that's been received for residence permits are 12,900. So it's only a third of that population. So I just kind of like, you know, a, a word of caution. I know that they're lean measures, but that is quite a shortfall uh, that will need to be addressed. Um, the final thing I wanted to say is one of the things that struck me all the way through working on this topic has been how little consideration there have been that some of the issues that British citizens are now facing will also be faced by EU citizens returning to member states. The things around uh, pension contributions or social security, or accreditation of, accreditation of um, qualifications, for example. I mean, I know that Cyprus, for example, was particularly hot on the accreditation issue because so many of their population have British qualifications. So there were some lines um, that cut across Europe that, that we should think about. So these are not issues that are only specific to British citizens, but might also have a broader, uh, broader um, impact on those populations. Um, you know, the kind of exportability of benefits, which, you know, uh, pensions is one of them. Um, so, so yeah, so I just wanted to raise that because it did seem a little strange that actually that is not where the conversation went. It went to British citizens, EU citizens, different places, when actually some of the rights that were being negotiated were relevant to, to those populations in those different places. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that's what I would say um, more generally. Um, can I just add one tiny, tiny final comment, Roger, on the point about embassy support? I think that in all of our heads, we think that the embassy provides support to British citizens who live abroad. But anyone who's been following what's been happening in the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office over the last five to 10 years will know that actually that consular support had been reduced and reduced and reduced anyway, and that consular support was not necessarily for resident British citizens, but for people who were temporarily there. So actually, those places did not immediately open up as a space where British citizens could go to get advice on their future residence rights. And it was only because um, the FCDO put in place specific representatives to deal with citizens' rights in a number of different states 
that actually those could, could provide that offer anymore. And as Clarissa and Debbie will tell you, um, actually now the, um, that dedicated support for citizens' rights within the FCDO, um, within those embassies, is now um, in, in a decreasing number of states as well. So it was very short-lived. Um, there, there are no plans, to my knowledge, within the FCDO to change the level of service for British citizens who live abroad. But I think that this is really different to the type of work that Paolo does as a, you know, as, uh, within, within the Italian embassy, for example. So we need to be, be quite careful about how we, uh, how we think about the role of those ambassadors and the consular service staff in those countries, because what we imagine they might be doing might not actually be what their remit is at all. Um, so, so yeah, anyway, that's my, that's my final note, Roger. I hope that's okay. That's a, good, that's a good point to end on. Thank you so much, Michaela, Debbie and Clarissa. Uh, that sounds like an issue, the one that you've just been talking about that we need to come back to. Life has become so much more complicated, not just for EU citizens in the UK, but for Brit uh, but British citizens living abroad. The ramifications of this will take years, generations perhaps to play themselves out. Uh, please do keep uh, getting the message around that these issues and challenges are still there and need to be addressed. We will do our best to continue to do that through the All-Party right Group on, on Citizens' Rights, but it's so important to hear those direct voices. Uh, Debbie Williams referred to In Limbo, uh, the second volume of which is out now, and I think, Debbie, you would like to just um, hold up a book and say the title for us so that we can see it and the camera comes on to you. I can't, not do, I can't do them separately. They have to be together in limbo, our friends from the EU living in the UK, in limbo too, that's us living in the EU. It's a wonderful project and I'm so thankful to Eleanor, Veronique and the gang for involving us. Oh. <laughs> Let's put, uh, we'll put more information on the uh, New Europeans.uk website about how to get hold of the book uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you very much indeed and have a great afternoon. See you Thank next you. time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.